Welcome back to the one and only podcast. Glenn, welcome back. Another month passes. H how is it another month? I know. It's nuts. That's, that's, I think Christmas that's, is just, it's Christmas just over, isn't it? No, it's April. I think that's a sign of getting older, is it not? Yeah. Life just passes so quickly. But what happened? What's been your, uh, what's been your highlights? You're just back from well, Dubai. I, was say, I think I meant to say my highlight was Dairy Expo. You're just back from but Dubai? But my highlight was yeah. Dubai. <laughs> yeah. How was that? Very good, yes. Completely switch off. Um, not a cow in sight, apparently, apart, apart from being on my plate. Any so camels? Was, I did see a couple of camels on the beach, really? yeah, walking along. Um, Don't talk about people like that. <laughs> no, there was no toes. Did they take the home? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. Um, uh, but that was, it was. What else did you do? Um, what else? Have no, you like, I could do Dubai. What, oh, what? in Dubai, um, literally Good just food? eat, sleep, sunbathe, repeat. chill out. Yeah, yeah, that was about it. What was um, the weather like? Warm between about. Warmer than Scotland couldn't be. On Sunday, it got to eleven degrees I, here. I did hear that it was eleven a, degrees. The first heat wave of the year, and yeah. then they, Scotland ripped it back right away on Monday. Yeah, <laughs> didn't rain for. One day. I do, yes, yeah. and I, I believe that you saw blue sky. It was really, really nice. Yes, I did see I did it. my first cut in the garden. Oh, first cut? Yeah, first cut done. Daffodils are up, cherry blossoms Quite are Quite a commitment, that's it then. you be mowing that grass. It's nice. Bit of fertilizer down in the garden. Do you have to keep up with your neighbors? Do you, does, does somebody go first and then they're like? Mm. It's quite tidy. Everybody kind of keeps it. So did you, do you start the phenomenon? I think of, I was one of the first. Oh, so now in the next door, I was like, for fuck's sake, Glenn's got on <laughs> out. And Mr. Lucas next door is cutting his grass. I'll have to get mine out. You know, I, I, I like it. I enjoy it. So. What's been your highlight? Without doubt, <laughs> UK Dairy Expo. What wow. a show, eh? No, it was phenomenal, wasn't it? Just the, the whole atmosphere, the, the quality... The, the quality of the of the livestock show was, in my opinion, one of the best Holstein shows that we have had in this country ever. The the other breeds was the Jersey show was just incredible. I thought it's, a, it's our best Jersey show. The red and white show continues to grow. It's the you know, I think there's 471 Big cattle shown. Uh, there was a huge crowd of people here. The the live streaming was another massive success. Uh, Thanks again to Herds Media for that. It was, I think, 12,000 wow. um, people uh, have now Louise, viewed the show. Louise said that she came home from Dairy Expo on Friday night, walked into her living room, and her husband Andrew had it on on their TV in the living room. Isn't that great? Bring in Dairy Expo to people's living rooms. Yeah. And it was good. We had like a phenomenal, a phenomenal champion, just a real, what I would call a, like a global su superstar. Well done to the Lairds for winning with that sidekick just and it's nice as well that um, she's uh, part owned by firm London in Quebec Canada wow. so I mean that's just just shows you the level of the, the, the level of cattle that we're showing there in the country that we're attracting uh, so is that the sidekick is that a same the same sire to last year's champion then yeah she Jennifer's a sidekick, a sidekick Jennifer. as well yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so like this it was it was a really sidekick show so the reserve champion was another sidekick from owned by Robbie Scott and um, Mr. Esquerdo from Ayrshire. So they, they, they just purchased her a few weeks prior to the show from Ewan Kennedy, also up in Ayrshire. So that's a great story as well. Um, she was a sidekick, so. I would say probably my highlight of Daily Expo was the showmanship. Some oh. of those little kids, unbelievable. Yeah, what, what the classes were huge. The classes, there was a lot of character building going on there because what do we go to? Do we go to like eighth or tenth or, or what? How, how, how far along do we get a rosette? Yeah, and actually that was one of the comments we got back. Um, and we've got a new um, private sponsor who wants to sponsor. But I just think, especially in the in the novice class, um, when I was watching it, I was like, oh, there's like, I think there was 31 in that class. Yeah. I was like, oh. They're only getting the rosettes down to tenth. I know, but that's quite that's quite a lot. I, I know, but really, I think in that age group, they don't really mind that it's taken part that counts in that age group. There's some little totes, but I think it's really important that they get something like a rosette and also even a packet of sweets or just something so they because they they don't go out and go oh I was twenty ninth. They go out and go. That was really good, and yeah, and yeah. they and they have a rosette to take home. I think that's that's something that will change for next yeah, yeah. year. But, but it was it, super cute. It was really really cute. And the, the pictures from uh, the, yeah, and it was also it was also nice. Um, 
our friend Allison that used to work here, they came over. She does the merch for Bordeaux Dairy for UK Dairy Expo. And her daughter took part and she won the class. So that, that was fantastic as well. I saw that because she said, she came in and she told the story and she said, um, I'd, what's her daughter called, Alex? Alexandra. Alexandra. She said, she'd pre-warned her and she said, don't be disappointed, Alexandra. The first time, this was her first time at showing at Dairy Expo. I came, the first time I came to a UK Dairy Expo, I sh or I showed, I don't know if it wouldn't be UK Dairy when I was young, when I was your age, the first time you should, you know, I didn't get, I wasn't placed around. So don't worry if you're, and then she went on and won it. I think that's right. <laughs> because. I think the first time Alison showed over at the National, I think I was shown as well when we were kids, and Alison put all the work in. She, we sent the calves over like a week before. She did all the work. We just arrived, and I, I won. But actually, really, she, <laughs> she, she did all the, she had all the calves trained, and yeah. Thanks, Alison, that was good. I still remember it. <clears throat> yeah. so, so now Alison's, Daughter, daughter will yeah, to tell it, it, her. Was, it was really good. They, they stayed. They stayed with us during the show. Oh, nice! But it was it was really good. Nice. And, um, no, but it was just so many. I think our shows went to another level. You yeah. know, on yeah. So yeah, it was good. Continues to go. Just another what, like eleven and a half months till we do it all again again. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got border. We've got the beef expo, the beef and sheep. Yeah, beef so. and sheep sister event. In November, in six months' time, so yeah. just and comes it, around it, quick. It all continues to grow. It does all continue to grow. The our our premises is seems to be shrinking. That's what it feels like. How do you mean? There's no space for it all to fit oh, in. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, because we're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the competition is getting higher and higher and higher. Isn't it? Yeah. Higher and higher and higher. I was disappointed though that Stuart um, Stuart Dunlop didn't turn up to show Jennifer. I know Jennifer was second in the class. Mm. I know we had Charlotte in. Uh, did they have, a, they had a baby calf? Did they have a calf there on the Friday as well? Yes, it won. Yeah. Yeah. So that was Jennifer's full sis sister. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, she looked she looked incredible. That just shows you the uh, what the what the show was like. But I was looking forward to. I was expecting Stuart to come in his white coat with his stick to show. He said he would. I can't believe he didn't up. hold it. Up. Yeah. Anyway, there we are. No, but it was a great show, and 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 we, I think we really enjoyed having uh, the guys from Australia judging. Yes, I hope yeah. they enjoyed their mission. Yeah, it's good. So this month on the podcast, we have the one and only John Carlyle from the butchery Lockerbie. What's his farm called? Ne Nether Dargavel. Yeah, I can't remember the name. Well, last but you know where it is. Oh, I know. Yeah, we drive past it all the time. So um, he's going to come on and. Tell us his story, so that'll be exciting. Um, so, yeah. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. <clears throat> so, hello everyone, and welcome to the April one and only. Uh, we have the one and only John Carlisle. Joining us today from Nether Mid. No, I, what is it? I, I never remember the name of your farm. <laughs> Nether Dargavel. Nether Dargavel. So, on there. so the farm, when you're heading towards Dumfries on A75, it's the, uh, the, the big, lovely farm on the left hand side before you come to the first roundabout. A famous farm and a very well known business. John runs the uh, Abattoir in Lockerbie and also the, uh, the butcher shop at Lockerbie as well. So, we're going to find out just how easy it is to be uh, a great beef farmer. John, welcome to the one and only. Thank you. Hi. How are things? Hi, they're good. Hi. No, it's a um, cha challenging few weeks there just with the weather and stuff and Easter, Easter coming up this weekend, which is good. It'll drive the, drive the whole meat job on a bit. I'm sure lamb prices don't really need driven too much more, but um, <laughs> uh, that's an all time. Don't say that. All <laughs> but it's, okay. <laughs> it's okay for you boys, but trying to sell lambs to to butchers is hard, and that they have to. They feel like they have to keep selling it because if they don't, then people are just going to go to the supermarkets and and buy it. But it's just they maybe need to just ride these next couple of months, and hopefully it will come down when the, when the springs start to come through. So the, so the so you haven't passed those lap that those increases in, in in values onto the consumer as of yet. We've had to um, we've had to our wholesale side um, we've had to pass them on to the butchers just to yes. obviously keep that margin there, but. Our retail outlets we've not we've not pushed prices on there yet, and um, we'll leave it. We do always this time of the year try and ride it through. There is 
losses made in the lamb job but um you just have to try and hope hope it does come down because lamb already was a very high priced product you know it was miles ahead of beef beef pork and chicken so we just have to ride it through and hopefully as i say hopefully it will come down but not too sure if it's going to because there is there is uh, do you think do you think lambs at a at a price now where it's like a a, a product that people use on special occasions rather than a on a weekly shop? I think so. I think Lambs always was kind of like that. A lot of the, I said to Laura before, a lot of the butchers that we supply, we used to take in 15 to 20 lambs a week. And now you're lucky if they're taking any more than five, you know, so it is definitely, it's not a meal that a lot of people are eating during the week. They're eating it, as you say, for special occasions and stuff like that. A leg of lamb can cost anywhere between, you know, a big leg of lamb could cost you now with the price of lamb, 70 pound. Mm -hmm. There's not many families can afford to put that on the table, you know, especially, mm -hmm. especially on a weeknight. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's yeah, it's definitely it's it's priced itself. With Easter coming up, there will still be good lamb sales, and this week have, has been not too bad lamb sales for us. But it's it's it would definitely if the price stays where it is now, and you're paying over two hundred pound for a decent lamb, it's definitely not going to hold out. And I know there's a lot of imports coming in, which is you know these supermarkets have got a lot of stuff that's cheaper, and people are just going to go there, and it's it will it will drop away. It'll balance out a bit, yeah. yeah. So tell me about the farm. Tell me about your um, what's uh, what does your farm look like? Aye, so it's a five hundred acre farm. They were moved over from Ireland in two thousand and two. So just uh, over twenty years we've been here now. Um, Dad and his brother farmed over in Ireland. Um, in Lyle Hill. Aye, well that was one of the parts that we rented Lyle Hill. Oh, farm. was it? Uh, yeah, the yeah. a bit of hill ground there. So um, what part of Ireland are you family? Uh, County Antrim, Temple Patrick. Okay. Yeah. Um, so farm there and then we moved over the the building job was strong over there at the time and um we moved over so um my brother my, it's my brother who he runs the farming side of it i'm not very much to do with the, the farm i'm more more in lockerbie yeah. full time so um i would do beef and sheep on the farm everything we don't have any sucklers we moved when we moved over with 300 suckler cows and that was primarily what we done and we had sheep as well but now for all the suckler cows that we had, it was only a small percentage of the job that we're putting through Lockerbie. So um, we just, and the labour, and it was quite labour intensive with that there. So we put off the sucklers and we're just buying in from a lot of markets around about, all around the country in Scotland. So F Finishing cattle and the same with the sheep, like store yeah, sheep. Yeah, yeah. So finish. no, we we'll buy, we've got our own ewes that we're doing. Yeah. There's, there's about 800 ewes that we're, we're pretty much through the lamb and now. So they are at home, a lot of them, there's, um, a few left to go, but we get we get it out of the way pretty early. Um, so what type of sheep do you farm at home? Uh, Texel Cross. So Texel we do cross. put this. We've got Suffolk across them as well for some of the earlier ones, and then just um, a few more white face. That, as I was saying before, that we, we drag them out kind of right throughout the year. That we've got lambs coming steady for a premium quality lamb coming good for the butchers all year round, and then we are buying in other lambs as well to do kind of wholesale jobs and. And have you manipulated your sort of lamb enterprise to reflect what you do in the shop in terms of breeding and all that type of stuff since you, because obviously what, when did you establish the butchery in the... Um, so that, we've been there just over six years now. Mm -hmm. So um, that was, um, I was at university in Edinburgh and then just my last year that was finishing. I'd done a bit of work experience in Macintosh Donald and ABP while I was there as part of the course and both of, both of them places were both offering me jobs and um, Dad was speaking to Bryce Taylor, who's the previous owner of Lockerbie, and he says, uh, Bryce was just explaining that he was wanting to sell the abattoir, mm -hmm. and I think the abattoir was actually destined to close, to be honest. Um, there was a wholesale business, which had a cutting plant up the top of Lockerbie, and then there was the retail shop that was there, so um, Dad had kind of thought to himself, oh, this boy might have something about him, you know, if these boys are both offering him jobs. So he said to me, do you fancy it? Do you fancy giving it a go? And I said, yeah, why not? So we took it, we, we took it on, and we've never looked back since, really. And it's been a great asset for the farm. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's been a lot of hard times for us throughout, and especially not really having too much knowledge of the meat job. Um, we've been quite lucky that we've had a lot of good staff. The main staff that were there were kind of um, key on making it work as well, and we've we've grown it just since then. We we redid the we knocked the old shop down, and rebuilt it. Because um, the shop wasn't, Bryce wasn't wanting to sell the shop because it was probably the only bit of business that was doing right. well. well. So, yeah. but we said if we're taking on the abattoir and the wholesale side down, we want to take on the shop as well. So, uh, it was good. So we knocked that down. Maybe that was five years ago, 
um, and then we, we put the cutting plant in behind it. So we did, and uh, the shop's been, yeah, it was, it's been a great asset to the business because we've redid all the whole, all new machinery and stuff like that, and and, and facilities for people, office facilities upstairs that are. Second it's quite a stark there. contrast from what was there. Yeah, it's very nice. Because <laughs> it was a yeah. tiny little yeah. shop in yeah. the middle, in the front of Tesco's, and now it's a huge. And it's, big, a, it's a nice modern, very it's a lovely uh, shop window. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice modern shop window, isn't mm. it? Yeah. Well, that's what we wanted. We wanted it to be appealing for people to come into the shop. You know what I mean? Because people, Dad says the old shop was like a wee cow shed, which so it was, and a lot of butchers are like that. You know, yeah. it's just it's old school type thing, but you you need to make it appealing, and people Definitely. want to come in, especially. We're in a great location where Tesco's is right yeah. next to us. A lot of people say, oh, you wouldn't do half the trade if they, mm. but then I believe if well, te Tesco's wouldn't do half the trade if you weren't there. Ah, well, that's it. We, <laughs> we, 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 yeah, right. we opened now on a Sunday, so we're doing, their percentage of sales have went up a bit on a Sunday. So, right. But they, that whole building wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Tesco, because they gave us a part of their car park to build. So they did build the whole thing and put the crane work up, because we never had any, we never had any space round about. We, oh, we so utilised yeah, every yeah, yeah. Si every single bit nice. of space. So I know it was great, and I think if people when they when they're coming to Tesco, they're, they're in their mind they're doing their shopping. So if we are, we're more or less right in Tesco car park. So it's good that we're there. And I think if we were up the high street, we wouldn't do half yeah. the trade. Yeah, either, you're probably either. right. Yeah, you're probably right. It's just it's just yourselves in Lockerbie, isn't it? There's only, yeah, there's yeah, no other no other no butchers other. in Lockerbie. No. Um, that sounds like a song. There's no other butchers. <laughs> 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 We get one made. Because <laughs> <laughs> it backs onto, is there housing round the back of? So there's housing round right the back. It's right in the middle, isn't it? The abattoir, yeah, it's in the middle. The abattoir is just in round behind it. So the abattoir, we could, ideal scenario would be having the cutting plant connected to the abattoir because at the minute we have to bring all the beef and stuff. It's to be cut down, it's to be put in a lorry and it's to be brought round to the cutting plant. But um, So is that literally like round the corner? It's, yeah, it's literally round the corner. So it's not far at all, but you still have to load it on and load yeah, it off again. Off again yeah. so um, tell us a little bit about like, what's the capacity of is the is the abattoir purely for your own use or do you do private uh, yeah. private slaughter? Or? Uh, so we do we do a mixture of uh, both. The majority of the stuff is our own. We don't really push too much the private side yeah. of it because we just we're working probably close to capacity. Are you minute. really? Just, yeah. just for the size of the plant, and if we did push it much harder, it's an older abattoir. So it wouldn't. Yeah, you put on it your probably. I would probably push it to its limits. But um, we're doing. Um, we're doing about 60, 60 cattle a week through there, and then maybe just over 100 lambs and maybe about 50 or 60 pigs. So we do all yeah. three species. Um, and you use that all yourself? Yeah, we pretty much use all that ourselves. We do it for a few other farm shops and stuff. We process their stuff, but um, there's very little privates now. We do, we do quite a lot of stuff for people for their own freezer. You yep. know, we'd book it in. We've got quite a big waiting list of stuff for that there people just phone up and say i've got a couple of pigs i want can you do them for the yeah. freezer and it's always good like it's a great time we don't do any of that november december because it's the busiest time of the year run up to christmas but it's great having it from like january to now and, and, any good stories like when you somebody stands in the pig and then they get a cow back that's like lamb <laughs> Any, <laughs> any, any, any good stories like that? I don't, we don't have any good no. stories. If we did, I wouldn't be telling you them. <laughs> but no, it's... Uh, Tastes like... It, it, could, pr pretty, uh, it could easily happen, but no, you're... Not many abattoirs do private kills nowadays, no, do they? No. You, you can see why, because it is, it is a bit of a... a bit you've if you've got one person bringing in a pig and you know you have to deal with it and then they're if they're really fussy on how they want yeah. it cut up and they're wanting this, that and everything... You, it's you, time consuming. It's yeah. very time consuming, but... It's also, it's, you could probably have a, it's, it's a key part of our business as well, you know, because we do, a lot of people are relying on us and they come back to us every year and they'll use us maybe, a lot of people that do maybe just have a few cattle and a few sheep, but then. It is unique because there isn't very many, that used to be more a common thing, that yeah. wasn't it? And it's, you probably are, in our, in our area, there's maybe just you guys that can offer that no, sort, of, definitely will. sort of unique unique custom service really, yeah? From start to finish, definitely, we're having the abattoir there. There's a lot of butchers that we supply that we process the stuff and then we deliver it to them and they butcher it because it's people from that kind of area. But yeah, it's um, it's it's key to have a, an abattoir in Dumfries and Galloway. And I think uh, we've we've been looking at a few other sites in our own Lockerbie and stuff just to maybe, if we were to expand the abattoir side of it, we probably wouldn't do it where it is. We would move it maybe out of town. outside the town. Yeah. It's yeah. probably because you just, 
we're not the avatar was there before all the rest of it was yeah, there. Yeah, you're kind of constrained. You now, don't yeah. you don't want to be in the town, and you would if you were to do it right, you would have your avatar and your cutting plant together. And if you were to build just a nice wee um, state of the art plant, it would make you know it would make life a wee bit easier as well. And it keeps we've got food standards there full time. You know we can't process unless we've got a vet on site. So they're always keeping you know they're always on your back for stuff. They feel like they're obliged to you know always make sure you're moving forward and keeping yeah. the place tidy, which yeah. we, we're also wanting to do, but. It's, um, it's never ending. No, it's never so ending. What I know nothing about. I know nothing about this <coughs> side of the side of the business. So, what's the biggest challenge? <coughs> running, running. Like, is it regulation? Is it keep? Is it? What is the biggest challenge? Yeah, well, my, my side of the business, I would say, in the abattoir side and the the wholesale is yeah, regulations now. It's getting it's getting crazy. We've got a lady that deals with that. That's more or less our full time job, and she's just there's audits with some of the like salsa accreditation and food standards. You know, there could be. There could be about fifteen to sixteen audits a year, so there's a lot going on. And then, but I suppose from a consumer listening to this, yeah, that kind of makes me feel secure. Yeah. Secure, yeah. And 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 those are the sort of things that kind of I think are important. That all all those sometimes you may be thinking, well, this is over the top, but mm -hmm. then our food standards are so high in this yeah. country, and I think that's what adds the you know that's what adds value, and that's what kind of I get frustrated when I hear about other imports coming in that mm. aren't or processed not. and produced to those sort of standards. Yeah. Why why are we why are we allowing are that we, to happen? Why are we even held to it? I know that. So, 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 so those, those, those are the sort of discussions that need to be had at a higher level, aren't they? Really? Definitely, for sure. It, should, it definitely shouldn't be allowed. And <laughs> I know other countries for export now are very, very strict that you're the same standards as them, if not a lot higher than them, yeah. you know what I mean? And that's but, how it but, should but, be. But we aren't. Because no. I do know that, uh, yeah. What about carcass balance? Does that, is that, or do you find, how does that work in your business? Because obviously if you're processing the whole animal, you've mm -hmm. got to utilise that whole animal to maximise your cost, don't yeah, you? Yeah. Do you find that as a challenge or do you find that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably, that's my biggest challenge yeah. personally because I do all the sales. So I'm on the phone to butchers, wholesalers, and it's just trying to place, like if I've got a pallet or something, a pallet of top side, a pallet of strip loins or something like that, it's trying to place it, you know, and a customer could be on two, three weeks. They're taking plenty of stuff and then, you don't hear from them for the next two weeks, you know, so. And like Easter coming up, you could do a sheep with like eight legs. Yeah, well, that's it. But you could set, set all the butchers yeah. are saying, stick on a couple of extra pair of legs of lamb and you're like, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll definitely not be doing that. And is that where, is that where the legs, the, the, so there was a good, there was a, a new deal with USA with um, lamb last year. Mm -hmm. Are those sort of export deals that we're making with other countries, do they help the carcass balancing? Or are they just taking the prime cuts are, like, are are, work, are are do some of them cuts that we don't eat anymore are not as popular over here? Do they are they exported? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so where 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 are the where are those export? Is it Africa? Is it Asia? Is it? There's yeah. a lot that goes into Europe. So there's there's a lot of whole lambs actually go into to Europe. So on the is, hook. But, yeah. Aye, there's a lot. Of, what's brought into the UK? You'll see a lot of the big wholesalers that we supply. Um, are they're like all want like a lot of restaurants like nice wee chump chops, you know what I mean? And they're wanting them all cut to six ounce. So these wholesalers are obviously needing maybe needing three, four hundred lambs to get enough orders for just how many chump chops they've got in the week. But then nobody in the UK can really do that or is breaking that many lambs. So um, so I have to. They, they're bringing them in then. You know what I mean? They're bringing in the legs or they're bringing in just the chump piece. Just that. To, to do so it, it probably it probably helps them a lot and it keeps that trade going but then again i think if that wasn't available would they then go for something else that they could only get from this country you know would they maybe go for a lesser quality mm. cut or like a chop or something like that so um, it's making it attractive because i guess in your business well certainly from the shop window your innovation is key yeah. in trying to make it attractive to the consumer so you can sell that product yeah because if you just gave someone like lamb kidney or lamb's liver yeah, yeah. thing like that they're not going to be like no. well what the hell do i no, do them, that? them days are definitely passing yeah. we, we we spend a lot of focus on on our retail side is try to work out what the customers want and then what they kind of want next and we've started we started there we've had it going a year another business a farm to fort nutrition mm -hmm. yeah. which it's nutritional meals and a lot of people that we do a lot of training with and that it's younger generation you know they're not wanting to cook the meal times are a lot less now and they're just wanting to bung it in the microwave, and then three minutes later, they're they're getting all their nutrients they're needing, the protein. So we um, would be meaning to do it for a few years, but we just never really got round to it. And then, 2023 after Christmas, we just said, right, we'll get this launched, and we did a bit of work for a couple of months just to get it there. And then, 
we launched out. So we do we do it's a set menu of ten meals, which changes every month, mm -hmm. um, and then it's distributed. We do nationwide delivery, so it can be we do quite a lot. Fifty percent of it's within the place in Galloway, and then the other fifty percent goes all around the country. So what's um, it called? Tell, tell us. Tell it's us far, it. farm to fork nutrition. So. Yeah. It gave a kind of it's it's all from our own farm, so that's the story. It's all closed, and then it's nutritional based, so it gives all your macros on on the lid of the product. So it's got everything in it, and it can link in with my fitness pal. People can just scan it, oh, cool. um, and that there. So it's yeah, it's it's. So where, where do people find out more about that? So it's on our to buy it. You can buy it on our website. So on the Butchery Lockerbie website, you can find it on Instagram or Facebook, um, and then. Uh, they can see all the information. It'll give you the full details of what the meals are for the month, and you can. There's different packs that you can order. The smallest packs, ten meals, and then there's right up to I think twenty-one meals, which we've got. A lot of people just buy a mixture. Some couples buy the bigger ones and they share them out. It works out a bit cheaper if you buy the bigger ones, and then some people just like have them for their lunches, you know, because yeah. a lot of people eat as a family when they get home. So that's fairly taken off. and That's really interesting, eh? With the kitchen space we've got locker, we're already doing loads of pies and stuff, so we don't really, they do it on a Monday and a Wednesday morning. They start they start about half three, four o'clock, and then they're finished by 11 o'clock, and that gets the that gets the nationwide delivery stuff out. But we've not, we have looked into maybe potentially getting a few ambassadors to push that side of it, you know, in the fitness industry yeah, a lot yeah, more. Yeah. But we're just at the stage at the minute where we're not really we can't we can't really do much more yeah. where we are at the minute. So when so, so give us a, give us an example of a couple of like a couple of what meals. would Glenn need to eat on a weekly basis? What would I to look like you? <laughs> so, <laughs> by the way, this is a wide lens camera that Alice has introduced this time. Uh, in. So no, there's, there's all different to change all the time. There's like there's like hunter's chicken. There's like pork ragu um, stuff like that. It changes up. They're they're really like before. When I started doing a lot of fitness stuff, I was I was eating stuff like just chicken and rice, and I was eating sweet potato yeah. and mince, and I, I actually dreaded eating. But now with these so... meals, they're all calorie counted, and we get the sauces and stuff like that. It does. I actually look forward to eating them yeah. now. Yeah, it's exciting. A, a lot of people. I should do. I should. I should, should do. I should do a challenge, right? You should do thirty days on farm to fork. Thirty days and see the difference. See the difference. Yeah. Well, if you want to do that, you go ahead, Glenn. What do you think? We'll talk after. I <laughs> we'll get it could be an amazing up. transformation. Can you imagine? 30 days. Come into the next, next Three podcast. meals a day. What do you get? Three, <laughs> three meals a day? Is that what you get in the pack? Uh, is that how you work it? You use it breakfast, get, lunch and dinner? Uh, you can get breakfast as well. So we do like overnight oats and there's granola and yogurt you can get as well. So um, I'd love to see you sit in your office eating your meal prep. <laughs> you'd be surprised. A lot, of my, a lot of actually my friends and stuff, if they've been... If they live with their girlfriend and stuff, and they cook all their meals, if they've been away or stuff, or they've tried, like they've not came on to them because they've just thought like girlfriends I, I haven't come on to I them. No, like, <laughs> the, no, the, 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 bo the boys haven't started them. Okay, okay. Yeah. But then because they've got obviously maybe someone that's making their food or that. But then if they've maybe been away or um, they're wanting to try them, they're they're amazed, you know. And then they've never stopped eating them like this. It's a godsend, really, because. Yeah. Um, this sounds interesting. It's a good idea because it just takes the hassle out of it. Like so many people nowadays want the convenience, don't yeah. they? And you can't really get that from the supermarket from their pre-packed meals. Yeah. They're probably really high in fat or high in calories or yeah. low quality. Yeah, full, full of salt and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, so. to make them tasty, I guess. Whereas here, if you're ordering them fresh, yeah, you know. Yeah. We're trying to keep for the quality of the product. We're trying to keep the price point like our. We sell them individually in the shop if we've got a few spare, um, for five ninety nine. Mm -hmm. So we do, and then if you buy the big pack, it works out at like four seven a meal. Mm -hmm. So they're they're packed full of protein. So there, there's a lot of protein in them. Maybe too much. The only the only complaints I've had so far. Too much protein. The, that's the only complaints I've had from a few girls. You know, because oh, really? maybe too too much for them. But what we've said, we have looked into maybe maybe doing meals with less, but. A lot of them, half them down. You know, they maybe have half for their lunch and half for dinner. So, um, it's good. It's good that way. But yeah, that's um, it's, it, we're lucky that other meal prep companies are having to buy off like someone that we're supplying. So we're already two steps ahead of them. So we can offer it at, at a pretty good rate, and we're we're trying to keep it as competitive so, as possible. Do, do you do you have like a, there's a lot, obviously a lot of science behind producing these meals. So mm -hmm. who, who's who. Like, like who's helping you? So my, uh, it's actually my girlfriend. She does. She runs the whole retail side of the business and does all the online. And then the farm to fork nutrition. She does all that as well. So that's it's driven by. She's got a team with her that she does all that and works out all the calories. So today, she was actually in the office. She was working out next month's menu. So it'll be launched probably the last um, 
this month's menu, the last, they'll make it the last of them tomorrow on the Wednesday and then on the Thursday we'll launch out to the public Very about what, what next week's ones are and then I love she, this. she worked out all the calories, this everything is, that's in them. This is the so type of thing I really like. Yeah, that's cool. So who came up with the idea? We, we should have brought you some down. It was, it was just between probably me and Emily and we'd be meaning to, well I'd been looking to do it for a long time and because obviously we're meal prepping, I was meal prepping and stuff. And So this came um, off the back of you sort of yeah. really jumping into the... We were like, we've got everything here we need. We've got the, you know, the kitchens are here and all the protein and stuff that we're getting for the meals was coming from ourselves. And you so. having your interest in training and understanding, yeah, yeah. fueling your body and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Tell us a little bit about the fitness aspect of you that's uh -huh. kind of... Because I think, are you the reigning... Britain's yeah. fittest farmer? C current Britain's fittest farmer. You serious? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you serious? So I, I didn't know that. Well, there you go. I've done no research for this guy. <laughs> so, so, so what's all that about? Uh, so so th three years ago, I seen there was a, it was advertised, so it was on online, actually. The Farmers Weekly, they run a competition. It's all for mental health and well-being yeah. in, in agriculture. So it's trying to get people into fitness, which I, I seen, I was quite, I was involved, with, I played rugby for Dumfries Saints for, for 10 years and I always quite liked the fitness side of it and then um, I tried, I, th I seen that advertising and I thought I'll give it a go. So I give it a go, train pretty hard for it and the first year I got to the final of it, there's regional qualifiers which you do. So what is all, what is all that, what's, what's it what involved? Do you have to do? So it, it tests your strength, your power, your speed and your endurance, so it's every aspect of your fitness, so you need to be strong, you need to be good at running, good it's at It's almost fitness. like world's strongest man isn't it only not maybe uh, weights but, but uh, it's more like uh, you've got the endurance side yeah. of it as well so they're wanting the full package so like the first year I've done it I've done it for three years actually in a row now and the first year I've done it I finished sixth um, and then the second year I've done it I finished second and the, the, the probably the reason why I never won it that year is because my endurance side was too good and my strength wasn't good enough so I realised I went away and said what do I need to do here right. to, up to get that so I bulked up gained about 10 kilo but kept my endurance my running at the same level and then so, so tell us a bit, little bit about those like um, what do you have to do activities like. So the in the final, the final that I won, there was uh, the the strength section was uh, you did a three rep max shouldered overhead with a barbell, and then you had to do um, quad bike deadlift. So you did as many deadlift. There was a quad bike on like the ramp thing. So what weight's a qu what quad bike? It was I think it was one hundred one hundred and fifty kilo. Just like with like you just stand and between wow. it and it had it was on like a ramp thing like that. The quad bike was sat on it and there was a couple of sandbags sat on it because they got taken off for the girls. So there's a girl side of it as well. And then you just to do as many reps up and down as you possible could. in a minute. Um, so that what was the strength get? side. Uh, I think I got 32 reps. Holy oh, moly! Shit. That, so. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> that's 60 seconds. <laughs> That is like yeah. world's strongest man, eh? <laughs> so I finished, I got second in the strength section on the day and the year before that I finished seventh, right. which just shows you. The and then, and then is it, was there like a, like a run running or? So there was a, there was an obstacle run after it, which you were going over bales. It was a, it was a 1K loop. You did that twice. So that was my kind of, uh, running's my strong point. That's what I like doing. And so I, I won that. And then there was another one on like a, have you seen the ski ergs? Yes. The, and the rowing machines, there was one on a ski erg, you to do that, and then you to do a farmer's carry, and um, you to do four rounds of that, and then there was another one around on an assault bike, and then you to go over the hurdle, carry the sandbag. So it is, they do, they, they have it down at, um, if you look it up Farm Fitness, it's... That should care. get a lot more coverage, but maybe I... Yeah. Farmers Weekly do cover it do quite it. a lot, yeah. It, it does get it. a good push, and it's got a bit... It's, Social CC a lot. Should, it should get, Farmers Week, uh, it should get a lot more, I think. Yeah, I think it should than, too. Than what, How long has it been going? Has it been going? It's probably been going six years, maybe. But it definitely is. The standard's getting a lot better because all the boys that were there last year, the top ten, they train were, hard very, hard. were very tight, yeah. and a lot of them... Or like I, I probably do enough on the farm to qualify. Tight. That's a good Northern Irish name. <laughs> He's tight. Uh, tight. <laughs> he is tight. Uh, they were all, they were all, t they were all tight lads. Uh, um, tight lads. <laughs> you ever heard that one? No. no that's, <laughs> tight in Scotland that's a, means you're cheap. I know. <laughs> but that's a proper county animal, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. He's tight. <laughs> He's a tight. tight <laughs> um, I think it's, I think it's a nice synergy though between farming and fitness, and you've obviously really seen that and yeah. effectively ran with it pardon the pun, but um, between feeling your body right yeah. through what farmers produce and like what So I think the I, there's a lot, like when we started the business at Lockerbie, it was very like full on and you were doing a lot of hours and stuff like that there, which now we've got a great community within, I go to the gym in Dumfries, we've got, a, it's called Elevate Gym in Dumfries and we've got a great group of lads that all train kind of together and they're all kind of like man minded lads, but it, it lets you like take take your mind. Uh, they're all they're all, all very tight. <laughs> <laughs> they're all very tight. It lets you take your mind off 
yeah. you know, the whole work side all of it. From different all from different sectors. All from different sectors, exactly. None, different none of them from the agricultural, really, like, um, that side of it. So, um, no, it's good. We've got a lot of good trips out of it, and we've done a lot of great competitions all around the UK, and we're, we're away there. I was going to say, Vienna. tell us a wee bit about the sort of high, it's a high rocks, yeah, isn't yeah, it, that you guys rock. are really into? Yeah. So you know what high rocks is, Glenn? Tell me. So it's a it's an event that have just launched. It's taken off. It's it's probably going to be very very big in the next few years. But it's more or less it's an endurance. But you do need your strength side as well. So that's why we've done pretty well at it because we've been we've had a bit of both. Um, so it's eight kilometres of running. You do them one at a time, and then you have to do an exercise in between each one. So you do a one k run, then you do a thousand meter ski, then you do a one k run, then you do a sled push, one k run, sled pull. And then there's more, there's like burpees, wow. farmer's guys. So you have to do, you start, and that doesn't change. That's It's all over the world. That course, it stays the same. So people... That's, is that a bit, little bit like, the, um, what do you call that other thing? Crossfit. Cross, it? cross. It's quite, it's, it's similar. But, but, it's but kind of the same activity. bracket as cross, yeah. CrossFit, but it's not. It's, CrossFit's quite a wide range of different skills that you need. This is very appealing to it. Like, there's all different ages doing it, all different abilities, because there's no, there's no time limit to complete it. So... You so it's the go, fastest. Could, the, uh, the point is the fastest person. Yeah, the points. fastest person. So everyone, they're all different. You, there's heat start every ten minutes. So you, you run these, John? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you can do them in in pairs. We've done quite a lot of pairs and then quite a lot of solos as well. So, um, and then you can do there's a team of four relay as well. So if people just getting into fitness, if they want to just maybe do a wee bit of it, they can do it as a team of four. Um, but no, it's, it's so you just you you. you Set up an area somewhere in the country. Uh, well, it's set High Rocks. They they're, they're it's worldwide now, so they're was all it? they're all over the world. And then you you do the the last one we done was in um, Glasgow there, and then we we're actually two weeks before that we we're in Vienna. We did one over there, and if you qualify, if you're in like the top three or four, you qualify for the World Championship, which is in Nice, actually in France this year. So that's nice. Um, that's that, nice. That'll be good. It's in June <laughs> as well. So it'll be that'll good. be nice. <laughs> The roasting, so I will go into that. There's a few from the gym and the representing maybe six have qualified for the world champs. So. Representing Great Britain, uh, yeah, representing GB. So that's cool. Um, it's good. And so is it age category? Or? It's age category as well. So there's overall, and then there's age category. So it's quite good. There's like, so do you do both? Uh, yeah, I will. You do if, if you're in both anyway, and then depending on how well you do, yeah, yeah. So well, you, you need to make, make sure that all the GB team are fueled by. Fueled by uh, yeah. What Found age group does it go up to then? So what does it, it goes start? up. So there was someone actually in Glasgow that was, I think, eighty-two. No way. It. Yeah. So it's yeah. This time enough yet, Glenn? I'm telling you, <laughs> I, I could be taking part in this. No, like the best, the strongest <laughs> categories too, are wow. actually from like thirty to forty-five because right. endurance sport you do a lot of people you get peak better. In your, yeah, in your yeah, sort of kind of middle. At that kind of age, so because when you're uh, like 18 to sort of mid 20s, you're just a bit young yeah, and growing too much. Yeah, yeah, probably that's probably your peak when you're like 25, 26, 27. Your strength side, I would say, up to 30, and then after that, your strength kind of yeah. drops away. Well, and your all endurance like, definitely. Yeah, like endurance runners and like marathon runners are always in They're their older. 30s, aren't they? They're never. There's never yeah. like a 16 year old marathon runner. No, no so. um, that's cool. So you represent GB. So you represent. You go over and it's over the weekend, and they all do. There's a big opening ceremony. And stuff and then they bring up you by your country so you can see where like last year it was actually in manchester which was quite lucky for us and then this year nice it's good as well so they're quite close to home um compared to like the year before that was in i think it was in america so it's, so um, you competed in the world's last year last year, year we finished third in the world last year wow. it was actually as a double oh, no, so oh, no. that um, is cool we got uh, cool. we did well but it's as i said it, it fits our training as well what we've been doing previous so so do you have sponsor, your sponsors doing that um we don't have any sponsors at the minute some we might put out but it's just we've got we're kind of by Lockerbie. yeah well that's <laughs> like, sponsored by it's like business. <laughs> people that we would want sponsored by is what we've kind of yeah. got our as our own um company so we do we've got obviously our own branding and stuff on it our jumpers and stuff with farm to fort nutrition on them and the butchery and stuff so we promote that very well, and we've got a lot of athletes that have came on. A few of the, a few of the competitions that we've done, we've had like pop-up stalls at and stuff. So, um, I people, a lot of people have got onto this, the meals. They're loving them. So, so you're hungry for more in June. So if you came third, did you say you came third, third last year? Third, uh, yeah. So, so you're looking for we'll try and push a higher on. podium. Yeah, yeah, definitely, but it's getting... So can we, is yeah. there any footage, can we, is there any footage that's on, on YouTube? I, we've got, we've actually, one of the boys that trains with us, he's, He's quite into the tech side of it. And he started a YouTube channel. It's called. We've called it. It's just where all us boys training and what we do. Um, that there. So it's called Always Ready Club. 
Always so ready sure, club. Sure that we're always ready for anything. So put a link in our description. Uh, you can we put a link do in. that. I'm gonna, that, I'm gonna check it out. That'll give you, and then you can see on like on Instagram, my own Instagram and stuff, just the high rock side of it. And you can look at if you look it up on YouTube, you'll see how big it's got. It's got. Yeah. Um, so what's serious. the commitment? Give us a sort of rundown on because that doesn't happen just by no. going to the gym two or three times. Two or three times a week, does no. it? Be farmer. Is that so a big Britain's I fittest was, farmer? No. A lot. Of, a lot of commitment has went in. It's the same as anything in life. You have to put the work in yes, to get it back absolutely. out. Absolutely. I've realised that over the years, and it's just we train more or less every night of the week. What does a typical week look like in terms of um, how does that do? You, is it like do you run through your high rocks drills? Do you like have specific days that you train yeah. running or strength or? So we do, yeah. We've kind of got. I, I write my own kind of stuff of what I do. So it's just we we go to like a, the track. We do a track interval session twice a week. So we've got a Wednesday and sometimes a Friday, and then um, I've got we're doing Berlin high rocks in four weeks' time. So oh um, we're kind of. We've got a set program. We're training hard now for the next three weeks, and then the week before that, we'll taper down. So we're really focusing on um, just the individual movements that are there for for that there. So it's um, now you have to kind of you have to kind of plan it out that you're working on a lot of your weaknesses, and then just just touching up on some of the some of the other stuff. So it's and nutrition plays a big part in your right. performance. Nutrition, I'd say nutrition is the main part. So as it's like. If you were to eat well, um, I don't think, and you didn't go to the gym, you could still, still be in good. Chance. You could still be in good condition, I think. For, for and then, and and do you fuel up then? Do you, do you build up for the big competition? No, you, you fuel it. So the high rocks, it's not as it's not as long as the likes of a marathon okay. or an Ironman. So you don't really need to carb up as much. Okay. But you do need to make sure you're fueled right because your body needs to be fueled and rested right going into it. So yeah, there's definitely there's a few days, good days of rest, and then. You do you do want to carve up for that pushing into the event? So um, I've learned so much today. <laughs> <laughs> we'll it's get really we'll good. get you signed up for one. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that I would love that. to see that transformation. There's one in that, the next, I would love that it. Could be yeah. <laughs> the next one in the the next one in the UK. I think is Birmingham. Birmingham. So that Can you could imagine? Be, that could be. You'd have to give up your. What do you do on a Friday with temps? You get a hot dog on a Friday, do you? Yeah, chili hot dog. <laughs> You'd have to give that up. You can still have the chili hot dog. You can still, 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 you can still eat it, but as long as the calories, you're burning oh, the yeah, calories, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Calories uh, in versus calories yeah, yeah, out. Exactly. It's like feeding cattle, isn't it? That's exactly, yeah. yeah. If you want them to get chubby, what? you give them lots of food. <laughs> And make them lie down. Make them, make them sleep. <laughs> I should have been an Angus guy. <laughs> oh dear. Um, what makes you get up in the morning then? What makes you do all of this? Um, do, you train, do you train in the mornings? Uh, no, I train at night. So I do personally. I don't. I don't really because I'm up early and started. We're in the abattoir cutting beef and stuff early in the morning. I've never really. I've never ever trained in the morning. We kind of. I prefer to get in, get the work done. And then we get finished up normally about um, four, half four, and then in the gym for about that time. So normally back home for then, and then into the gym and get that done and out of the way within a couple of hours. Um, and then because you don't want to be training too late either, because then sleeping's another massive Good. part. Part of recovery. You need to make sure you're sleeping well, getting at least eight hours a night. Um, I know that's easier said than done for a lot of people, but that's that's probably I'd say behind your nutrition, then sleeping, and then. I probably train and just training hard as well. So, um, so what makes you want to do all that? What makes you want to? Yeah, I just think the world to get better. I think it's we we are all as I said the group that we've got is so competitive within each other. When you we sure go like when it. we go to a lot of competitions, like people are not in this similar level because they don't push themselves as hard. But we are all so competitive and we want to be better than each other that um, we see that. But I just I just like competing. That's the main thing that I like doing, and it's you get a buzz out of it. Mm -hmm. As well, and I, I love the, the the whole job that we do, the the meat job, and how it's ran on from the farm. So yep. I like that side of it. Enjoy what I do there, and then I've got that as well, which the fitness it's side, nice which balance. can take take my mind off it as well when when you need to, because it's also quite challenging. But no, it's it's all good. It goes well as a as a package, and there's, yeah. there's plenty happening to keep keep you your mind mind busy. You know, so that's really good. Going back to the farm, so you're buying all the cattle. Mm -hmm. Your brother does that. Your father does that. Um, my, my my brother and my dad do all that, and then we've got a few other um, people that buy just in other markets you, up, yeah. up country, like St Boswells and the them other markets. So, 
Yeah, it's um, it's all the, all the time. There's cattle coming in, you know, from all different markets. So we've talked a l we've been, talked a little bit about the lamb side of the business, but on the cattle side of the business, mm -hmm. like what's what's the best? What makes the best steak? What makes the best steak? Like so. what's what's the what's the best beef breed in the world? If I was to have one breed that we, because we're very selective of what we put through our own shop. Um, and then the other other butchers that we supply are wanting you know something a bit different. So that's why we have all different breeds of cattle at home on the farm. There's not like there's not all Angus so there's not all limousine. It's just it's a mixture of everything. Yeah, to supply those different. To supply all them because some butchers do like a bit leaner stuff. You know yes. they're wanting like maybe a, a something that's dying a three um, grade fat class. So they're wanting that. But then there's other butchers and ones that we supply down in London that are wanting like really thick fat. They're wanting four H's full of marble, you know, because that's what the market is. So when I walk into your shop and uh, the big T-bones are hanging up in the corner, uh, what breed are they? So we select normally Aberdeen Angus, Hereford, and just sometimes a few continental breeds if they're a nice cover and they're, look at, they're looking they're looking well, but mostly I try and stick with native breeds. I do feel that they eat a lot better. Heifer beef as well. Um, see, we I, see. I, thought, I thought they were because they're the best T-bones in the world. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they're, yeah. Love it. Love it. But, I, I, but, but I, I just I was interested to know what, yeah. what they were. So native, native breeds, normally what we do go for them, we've got a lot of our heifers that we do, we, we, we do process a lot of bigger bullocks, so we do as, as well, but that's more for a boxing job because you get the big yield yes. out of them. Yeah. But the heifers, and that's what a lot, of a lot of butchers we supply that are still buying carcasses, they're wanting like a 300 kilo dead weight like Aberdeen Angus R4L, yeah. just something just nice, not too big, double not muscly. Not extreme, yeah. Um, that's what they're wanting because it's by far the best eating quality. Um, there is a good market as well. The bigger bullocks, we do sell steaks from that in our shop as well, but it's it's at a price, you know, and it's we, we want to cater for, we don't want to just be one high-end market that we're catering for on the retail side, we want to be catering for everyone. So we've got them um, bigger steaks. They're a lot better value for money, but they're maybe not as good eating quality. So we still, we still they're still there for people. That and want do you ever them. do any sort of speciality stuff? Highlander, Dexter, yeah, we do. We've Irish Moyle? We've had a bit through and a bit, we bit of, there's Wagyu the odd time or stuff like that there. So it's always, it's always, it's always gets offered and you can, you can buy that in as well, but um, we try and just, we've had all different breeds of cattle through, so we have um, th through the abattoir and a lot of butchers that we supply. If you do have something special, like a Dexter or something like that, they love that because then they, they, they buy maybe a side of beef or so a week and then they can use that as a selling point. Yeah. And it gets customers into their shop, you know, I'll, I'll maybe go in there and try that. So. so do you use provenance as part of your marketing campaign in terms of marketing to the customers opposed yeah. to the butchers? Is that yeah. quite important to you? Uh, it's, it's very important to the butchers as well, but yeah. I think that's, we probably don't push that enough to be fair. Well, maybe, well, maybe it's the retail side of the business that we're probably going to look to expand mm -hmm. in the next few years. Um, so we're, we're probably, we probably need to do a wee bit more of that and show, you know, the full story. Yeah. That our farm's like 11 miles from yeah. the abattoir. So it's, and we're Pe in, people really love that story. Yeah, they, they do. do. And yeah. I, th I think that's where it may not necessarily add value to the product, but it'll probably retain customers and, yeah. and, and build loyalty within your, I, th I think people I think like so. that as well it kind of it, it's uh, emotion is a lot telling a story means yeah. a lot to a consumer yeah. doesn't it where they can see if it's come from even the name of the farm can mean quite a bit to them can't yeah. it yeah oh definitely knowing it's from the same place and yeah they, they know exactly and they can tell the story you know if they've got friends over or if they're because that's like a thing. usp that like none of the big retailers can actually facilitate yeah. you know they can say it's come from select farms or it's come from our trusted they, farms they, but they can't say it's like come Tesco's from put like some sort of made up farm name yeah, yeah. i mean that just makes me want to uh, <laughs> you know, like um, Hilltop Farms. Yeah. yeah. So that was a marketing campaign that probably worked very well for them. Probably does still work very well. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's Hilltop Farms does not it exist. Doesn't exist. It, yeah, it's just yeah. But it does show that, like, you know, even when you buy veg or something like that, like, they've started to put like because they can do it because of the volume yeah. they're buying for like potatoes or something like that. They can put the name of the producer. And that's like trying to market to the consumers. Say you bought them from Jackson of Penrith or whatever. Right? But it does work when you walk into a lot of Tesco's. Like they'll have Robert Graham Senior and Robert Graham Junior. Oh, in Aldi, yeah, they do. Yeah. I know, is that Aldi? Or is that, yeah, is, is it, it Tesco? Aldi. I think in Tesco as well. So depending on who they supply, but they do have they do have real farmers up on as you walk up into above, some of the yeah. shops. And when you know them guys, it's thinking, well, that's that's really good. They're yeah. but you're dealing they're dealing with those guys. I do think that really. Um, yeah, the only thing that they lose, obviously, for supermarkets is that's just a 
an illustration that's illustr not yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, if they have like they have Richard Barber up in that's Aldi right. and Dumfries. Yeah. Every product in there, they're making it look <laughs> like look they're supporting his business. Yes, they buy a percentage from him, but whereas a USP from a butcher is if you're taking it from farm to fork, you can say this all comes from, yeah. you know, we know exactly, it's, you know, it's come from our front field or whatever. I was also telling them about the cocktail sausages. Do you call them cocktail sausage over here? Chipolata Chipolata sausages. Chipolata sausages. In, in Northern Ireland, they're called cocktail sausages. Yeah. Tell them that, like that they're bound to be, what, where do you get that recipe for them? They're the best in the world. I was <laughs> Honestly, because I... Honestly, to be fair to him, this is actually legit. He was raving about them before. Yeah. Yeah. So we do a lot of the stuff we, we inherited with the business and recipes. But oh, really? we, we have done, whenever with them, actually, to be fair, we changed it. We did Where did you get that recipe from? We did a wee tweak. So we did, it's just a, a homemade recipe. So as we can't share He's that. wanting you to from say it. It's from Northern Ireland. Ireland. That's what he wants is you to it? say. It's not actually. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was not. It was developed here in Scotland. So... Um, I, you love I, them? I do. They're really good. Yeah. Yeah. So we do. Uh, we make a lot of them in sausages and burgers, and we've got a kind of we've got a good facility in, in there at Lockerbie for doing sausage machines, burger machines, especially when it comes summertime. We can we can Th those little sausages are so really? good, so good. We sell. Um, <laughs> we've done a few a few of them at Christmas time. That's when it's amazing how many. How, how many ma sausages do you do at Christmas time? Um, do well, you know a sort of like? I think they put through about two ton of pork trim in one day. So. I know, Which made I think maybe we bought a quarter ton <laughs> at Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we we'll need to, an extra we, ton on for him. We, <laughs> bought, we bought a lot of bags. Yeah. We'll need to keep you coming, but yeah, there was a serious <laughs> amount. That we do all our own pigs and blankets for people as well. And wow. I think there was twenty thousand. We got a squad in. A few of the staff God. have got children. They're off off on holiday on and stuff. Holidays, yeah. Uh, their kids and stuff. So um, we had them in for a couple of um, back shifts, just doing rolling pigs and blankets, and there was well over twenty thousand done. I think. That's a phenomenal. Few, That's few, few, days, isn't it? few days before, but it's just people go. You know, people, people go wild at Christmas, don't they? Yeah. They do uh, go. It's, it's a time. It's it's a good time for the butchery side of it. We just need to. A lot of butchers are busy, and a lot of butchers. That's the one time that they, they, make, they, they yeah. lead up to, you know, and they make good money out of, and that's what probably keeps them going. So, um, no, it's it's good. So, what's next on the agenda? What's on the future of? Yourself, the business. What's what's next? Um, so on your... there's a few things we've got in the pipeline. We've we've actually we're taking on our third because so we've got a shop in Lockerbie and then we've got a shop in Broxburn as well, which is inside a, it's inside a Scotmed, um, convenience store. So they were wanting to bring back more like bringing butchers back into their like stores. A counter, yeah. So it's like one of their bigger shops. It's like a mini supermarket. We put in, um, we put a butcher's unit in there. So we've got staff up there and we were passing through the central belt. Um, three, four times a week anyway. So it was a bit of a no-brainer. We put in the tender for it and they came back and they said, we love your story, that there. So they're looking to push that on a wee bit more. And then we've just recently taken on another shop, a local shop, um, so I have, which is very close to home, actually. Um, so we're hopefully... We're hopefully mm -hmm. going to be in there. The suspense. Uh, the tell us. The suspense, not yet, but <laughs> hasn't uh, signed. <gasps> oh, it's all, it's, it is all signed and sealed, but it's just. Um, <laughs> no, we're, ho we're hopefully. We're not you heard it first, folks. Here. <laughs> we're hopefully. He's here. Uh, first. We're, ho we're hopefully going to be in there end of April. Cool. So that'll give us a good market into um, that part of it. So that's kind of what we're probably going to focus on over the next few while. That's got a, a good area and stuff at the back of the shop. So we'll potentially move our kitchens down to well, there as well and we'll maybe do a bigger kitchen unit and that'll allow us more space at Lockerbie and um, that side of it so it's definitely the way that we're probably going to try and push the business there's a few other sites that we're looking at around about in Dufries and Galloway that could potentially put shops in and um, we're obviously not wanting to take away from our own yes. shops because the more a lot of people say to me that they come live in the priest we come to your shop to Lockerbie, yeah. anyway do you not think it'll affect your Lockerbie store but then I say to them but how many times do you come to lock them in and they say we come like once every 10 days or once every seven days and i say what about if we had a shop in the priest and they say well we'd probably come at least once a week yeah. th three three to four times a week you know what i mean if especially if, if you're offering lots of value-added products so they can come and yeah. just get on the way home or whatever yeah exactly that's so going to maximize that isn't it it's just um no it's it's what it's, it's being just accessible for people you know and convenience nowadays is massive we've realized that with the online delivery we do a serious amount of nationwide stuff oh. people People come in and it's normally one of the last stops they can get good quality meat or scotch beef before they go over the motorway. Or they come into this. So, well, it's, this country. It has. It's got, <laughs> it did have. It used to have a. Well, it still does have a decent enough selling point. But we say say to people, you know, that they can buy online now and they're amazed. You know, we can. They put the order in. If it's in before like midnight that night and then it'll be delivered, it's dispatched the next day and they've got it the following day. So 
it's really like so who delivers that? Who, what, what so we we use we use DHL, so we do we used to we used to use DPD, but um, they were getting a wee bit uh, a few parcels were going missing, so they were in stuff, and I think it, it's just what depots you work well with. I think DPD were probably one of the best, but we moved to DHL and Touchwood. We've not had any issues at all, and there's been there's been a there's been a lot of parcels put out around around the UK, so um, it's good that we can cater for. That yeah. way, and I think it's a it's a great service that they offer, um, that a lot of butchers are now capitalising on, and they're doing like a lot of, a lot of trade that way. Uh, so how do you package that up? Do you like ice ice pack on it? Yeah, yeah. So it's all everything. All products are vac packed, or if they're pies, they're over wrapped. So they're all properly sealed, and then they go into like we buy the boxes as a whole piece. So it's got a, it's a box, and then it's got the film inside it. So it's already comes. You just more or less it comes flat packed, and then you've just to tape it up. And then the product, you put ice ice at the bottom of it, just dry ice, and then you put the product in, and then you line the sides of it with ice as well. So it's, oh, it's, great. it's amazing. And it's like 24 hour delivery. It's, te it's tested up to 48 hours. So that right. product, we, you could sit it in this room for 48 hours, and okay, the product okay. would still be good. So a lot of uh, it's a perishable good. So if the product's not then delivered within 48 hours, it's returned or it's disposed of. So you need to, that's why it is important that them providers are doing their job and they're getting it to yeah. the location. And people, and people know about it, you know, it's not... Maximise the standards that they're buying from you. Cause yeah. It's phenomenal that you can do that, really. And, that, and I suppose that side of it will only continue to grow as yeah. people use that medium to shop more and more and more and more. Yeah, well, you and can, will do you can push that as well quite quite a lot. We don't probably, it's another thing we probably don't push enough, but we probably should because uh, we, we do see loads of, like, everyone's repeat custom, you know, you see people ordering, like, say they're in Stranraer or they're in Manchester or they're in London, you do see, like, they're ordering every two weeks. You mm -hmm. can see you the kind of same orders coming through. So, And then you do get, like, more orders, people just clicking on or seeing on social media is a massive drive, as you know, for everything nowadays. So we, we use that as probably our main market. We don't do any marketing out with that, right. really. Um, you just have your website and all your social channels. Yeah, yeah, That's... so we've got the website and then just Instagram and Facebook is what we use to, to do our... Um, or advertising and we've not really. Do you work a wee bit with um, QMS or uh, anything we do. Like we're, we're, all, we're, we're QMS, so they do all our accreditation. So we're, we're fully QMS approved right throughout the whole, both our sites actually. So we do a lot, they, they do really good marketing campaigns and stuff and that there, we're linked in with them. So they send us a lot of good visuals and stuff for, to use um, and you know, no, they're really they're really good that way and they're they're pushing on. I think they're really they've rebranded and redeveloped a lot of stuff over the last few years and they've got a lot of good people on board now. Um, and I think yeah, that's that's going to help. It definitely is because there there was there was I think Scotch beef used to have a good premium. You know, mm -hmm. farmers were paid like twenty pence a kilo more for Scotch beef, but then that's kind of that's kind of leveled out now. That's non-existent. But I think um, a lot of butchers we supply. That's all they want, you know. They'll not touch anything else, and it's like, is there really much difference at all in the two products? But then they say it's all about the water that they drink, you know, it's pure and stuff like that. There, and they're just, it is, it, it's they love Scotland, yeah. You know what I mean? And it's they just grass. want Scotch it's the grass. grass. It's the grass. The grass and the water. That's what they say. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> I'd say what well, it's just the borders there. You know what I mean? It's, the, it's I think that's. Have part, you ever tasted? Have you ever tasted the grass in? Carline? No, I'm not eating it. Just kiss it in Gretna. Oh. It's different. It's different. <laughs> it's different. I'll, st I'll stop off on the way home. <laughs> so, uh, a little bit. Are you are you using the data that you're collecting from your customers to like learn learn their? You know, like Tesco's has the what do you call the, the club card? card. Yeah, yeah, the club yeah. card. So they they almost know yeah. what you're going to be doing. What you're going to be so, buying. So have you have you got software to like track, track your? Track your customers' behaviour so you can maybe contact them maybe if they haven't. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. Um, or here's a wee are, are you ha Yeah. Have you got to that level yet or not? Yeah. Yeah. Are, are, so we've, we've, you, yeah. We'll put in a full new till system there maybe about two years ago, mm -hmm. which shows is very, um, very close to each customer. So they're, they they get loyalty cards. So they do, which is similar to Tesco Club cards, mm -hmm. and they get a, they get a wee bit back out of that as well. They save a bit and they can put money onto like a Christmas club. Or a, or a savings. If they say that you come in and you spend four fifty and you give me a fiver, that you can say put that other fifty p onto my Christmas club, you know. And oh, then if okay. they build up maybe forty fifty pound, they can use that at Christmas. And a lot of people for the little sausages. For the sausages, so you, you, you should maybe do that. <laughs> you'll, you'll get your sausages for free at Christmas. Yeah. What a bonus! They'll taste even better. <laughs> 
So no, we do that whole that whole system. It's called Scotway. Actually, we use that's clever. Um, and they're very they're very niche in what they do because they they're working very close with butchers and stuff. It's that that's the industry they're want to do. And a lot of butchers are going to them with new ideas or how they can make their life easier. So they show it shows. I've got it on my phone actually. The app and it shows the full breakdown of everything, what customers are buying, percentage, you know, say your pies are selling the highest percentage today, beef, lamb, that's pork, really ready clever. meals. I'm glad, I'm glad you're doing that because that's, that's, uh, that keeps you really connected to your, yeah, and, and probably builds up loyalty, doesn't it, as well? Yeah, and it, and, and it allows you to learn, like understand your market because that's the only way you can improve, isn't it? Because yeah. if you just produce a product and expect the consumer to buy it, whether they want it or not, it's not going to happen, is it? So we took over the business are like for for instance the ready meal side of it was like non existent mm -hmm. and there wasn't much trade for that side of it. But nowadays that like pies, ready meals, ready to eat stuff will probably make up about thirty percent of our retail business. So that was zero. That was like more than zero. Thirty. There was still a bit of pies, it was maybe like yeah. ten or fifteen percent pies, but but now it's like it's really booming off, and that's yeah. exciting. Isn't Marketing it? has a lot, of, a lot to do with it, doesn't it? As well, and how you present it. Yeah. You know, if you say like, you know, if you did like a, a lamb kebab or something like that, you could cook on the barbecue. Yeah, yeah. If you present that right to the consumer, they're like, all oh, right, okay, yeah, that's fine. That only takes like that's fifteen easy. minutes on the. Yeah. Where they would think, oh, I don't know what to how, do with that. How do we do that? So yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, it's making something look nice, you know, yeah. and making it easy to do for yeah. people um, and understand. And then yeah, if you if you give cooking instructions for a lot of stuff, it does help as well, and people. People find it easy to do. They'll, they'll say. And you find home. more. Um, uh, I once listened to an interview, and someone said that they find butcher shops a little bit daunting in terms of going in, because traditionally you go into a butcher shop and be like, "Oh, can I have a pound of mince? Can yeah. I have this? Can I have that?" Not really understanding what they're asking what for, is. what they're to do with it, and how yeah. much it's going to cost them. So that really put them off about coming in because they had no idea. Mm -hmm. They were just being driven about what they were meant to ask for. Yeah. So do you find like you're maybe more accessible, you're more approachable as a company and that allows people to come in and actually feel more confident in understanding yeah, what they're I asking think, for? I think the supermarkets, they, they've done it very well mm -hmm. all, over the years that they've put a price on everything. Yeah. So people, a lot of people work on, they're on a budget, so they yeah. come in and say they've got 30, 40 pounds to spend in their shop and they want to go up to the till and they don't want that to be over that. Yeah. So if they're picking up a steak or something, they want to know that that's 5.50 or 5 pounds, whereas they come into a butcher shop and it's say it's thirty pound a kilo, they don't and then know. the butcher's going and cutting it. They don't. They get a wee bit scared that it's going to be yeah, over their budget. Yeah. So never thought of that. That's yeah. where we can. Uh, we have. We've got a big multi deck in the shop where we can put products on that are already priced, and that probably does the server over counter and the multi deck. There's probably like fifty fifty right. side of it where, where we sell probably fifty percent off the multi deck, fifty percent over the server over. Um, so it's. I, I think it's it's a real good selling point that you can put a price on something. And then people know exactly what they're paying for. Yeah, it gives them a bit of confidence, that, that, doesn't that, it? That, that people don't want to go and say, oh, no, no, that's too uh, much. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, you'll get the odd customer that will, will be happy to do that, but then a lot of people <laughs> will feel embarrassed. You know, they yeah. wouldn't say, they would say, no, put that back. It's too yeah. much. They yeah. feel like they have to take it, and then they're annoyed, you know. Yeah, yeah. They didn't, they, they didn't know that. Or they and that puts work them off out. a wee bit, doesn't it? Because they don't, yeah. they're a bit scared yeah, you, to go you, in the you, next you can, time. You can understand those, yeah. can't you? So that's why the majority of products we do, we try and price them per product, but then there's obviously, if, as, as long as you can get, like, say you're making burgers, and the bur burger, we've got a burger machine that can spit them out, and they're, they're nice, they're perfect size, you yeah. know what I mean? So we're lucky that way that they can be identical every time, and we know that we're not giving them an extra 20 or 30 grams yeah. you know, on the burger. As long as you can get that right and you're not losing out on your margin, then you can very easily, or you get your butcher that can cut the steak like eight ounce every time, you can then put it at a, at a price that's working, you know, it works for the customer and it's working for the business as well, so. And if you're producing the cattle yourself and, and like allowing you to have that flexibility and producing what you need for your shop, yeah. you have that control over that as well. It's yeah. not like you're having to go to the market or someone's sending you in a load of beasts and they're all different shapes and sizes. And Well, that's why we're very lucky. As I said, we work with a lot of heifers, a lot of bigger bullocks, but um, the, that was probably, a bit, my phone was going off there, that was probably Ian, my brother, phoning me saying, what are you wanting for tomorrow, cattle-wise? Because if I've got orders in for, say, bigger strip loins for um, a company that's maybe doing a big wedding function or something, then I need to be processing bigger bullocks. Do you know what I mean? So he would just, he's in, he's got, we've got them all separated at home on the farm. So he would so just So he'll go, go out like this afternoon would, and draw yeah, them? Yeah, pull out 20 fit, fit big bullocks or if I'm wanting nicer wee rows for like a high end job down in London, plenty of fat cover, he would go and he would pick out the, out the heifers. So it makes my life a lot easier that we've got that. It's more or less we're using the farm as a layerage. Yeah. But we're feeding we're feeding the cattle up to properly finished. There's no, we don't we don't process anything out of the market. We take it back. We think it makes a big big difference in the Just eating quality of the meat. 
takes the stress out of the cattle. Do you know what I mean? Because if you're processing, processing straight out of the market, a lot of cattle do get raised up. Do you know what I mean as well? So we're taking them home and we're, we're letting them settle down, we're feeding them and we're putting just that nice cover, nice finish, nice so, flavour so to the meat. So how, do you, how, how are you finishing the cattle? What's, what's the ration? Um, so it's just a mixture of stuff we're buying in, there's feeding coming in all the time, we're buying in, there's a lot of barley, we feed a lot, we can grow maize at home in the farm. Which I've is, seen that you grow, you've grown maize there for years. Which is yeah. quite good, we feel like that's a, a, a top end feed. for Corn fed for, beef. <laughs> Corn fed. <laughs> we're finishing cattle and we, aye, that's, we believe that the flavour comes yeah. from Okay, your breeding's a part of it, but from the f the finishing, the ration oh, that you're without, giving them, without question, right? Um, so it's definitely it's like I used to work with a farm, and we used to have a customer that would want them finished for the last forty days on a predominantly corn-fed, grain-fed diet, diet because yeah. that gave that fat cover and that sort of yellowy texture yeah. to that, and it gave that taste. That grass-fed whole marketing thing, it's good, and people love the thought of it. You know, they're out of grass, but but c cattle definitely do need to finish them and get the flavour. Yeah. Because um, time, times of the year, the bigger processors, they've got cattle and they are grass fed, you know, because it's good good weather. Um, and the flavour, you can actually see it in the supermarket, it drops off the flavour of the cattle because they're not being mm. fed. So it's. Um, and then they want them at a certain weight. Yeah. So they take them to that weight, and whether they're finished or not, they're killing them. Yeah, they're processing they're them. Not they're they're no. not quite there yet. But we'll, not, we'll not process a beast unless it's finished right. You know what I mean? It has to be perfect, perfect consistency right through. And the, the the lamb finishing the lamb is that um, a similar science? Similar, yeah. We can, we we do we can push. It all depends. We do most of our lamb is just grass fed, and that you can finish quite well off grass with lambs as long as it's good quality. But I have seen us if there are needing a wee bit of push or there's a lack of there's a lack of power in the grass, then you can you can push them on, feed them a wee bit as well. So yeah, it's definitely um, we, we process all our lambs. They're all 50 kilo live weight. And then they're also, also they're, they're, they're big lambs. Yeah, they're big lambs. So we're wanting butchers are really wanting a lamb that's probably dying about twenty five kilo, mm -hmm. um, just to get a nice size chop uh, and that there. And so, so were, were butchers then making an absolute fortune when they were like ninety quid? Oh, lambs. Yeah. Not really. No, to not be really. fair, they were yeah. they were probably a lot of butchers will say that lambs. That's why they stop. A lot of butchers don't sell lamb at all. Yeah. They've just stopped doing it because if you if you imagine like beef at the minutes in around the five pound mark and lamb's dead weight are touching on like nearly nine pounds. Nine quid, yeah. So and then your porks it's right down at like two yeah, two forty, two fifty. So there, there's yeah, a, no. there's a big, big difference in different proteins there. Do you know what I mean? But, and with the best will in the world you can tell all the stories you want, but consumers do vote with their, their purse, don't oh, they? Oh, oh absolutely. You know, yeah. it, it's lovely to say that you would like the view of cattle grazing and mm. sheep outside and all that kind of stuff, but unless you're willing to pay for it unfortunately. Yeah. It's not going to happen. There's a ribeye steak in a menu and it's twenty pound less. You know that they'll probably like nine times out of ten they're probably going to go for it. Aren't they? Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. But that's just that's just the way of the world. Um, but lamb, it, I mean, personally, from uh, from our point of view, lamb is expensive yeah. for a, a weak meal and to get the 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 protein value, the energy value out of it. It's it's a it's a lot. Yeah, like challenge. if you buy a couple of chop like four chops, you know, in comparison to buying the same level of protein that you mm. get out of mince or beef. For a weekday meal, and even two chops is not going to feed my husband at home. It'd just be like, Christ. I need four or five. Yeah, at least. <laughs> and then before you know it, you spent like twenty quid on uh, yeah. on one meal. <laughs> but they do, they do, like the likes of QMS, as you were saying before. They do a lot of marketing campaigns on that side of it, and make it like quite fashionable, you know, with stuff that they can do with lamb and beef. So it's they are they are trying to push it hard to. To keep keep it moving, and I think well, there is obviously a big demand for it, isn't yeah, there? Because especially this time of year, and I think over the next five years, there's, you're going to see shortages even more in the lamb side. Especially with the beef's going to become, I think, less and less. There's going to be more have to come from the dairy side, um, just because there's that many people have put off cows and stuff like that. The government needs to have a wee quick quick check to see that it's boys that are actually doing the the, the producing of livestock that are, needing, there. that are needing the subsidies and they're needing you know paid for what they're doing uh, if they're putting because livestock and lambs in the production ground. is one of those things once you're out of it you're out of it it's yeah. not something you dip back in nah, and out of is it and it also takes it takes 24 months if there is a shortage of exactly it takes it's 24 months yeah. before you can make an impact on and where that shortage is but, but then if there's been a lot of cows like taken out of it it's there it's hard to get them back in isn't it almost really? impossible but, but we will rely on the dairy herd to where is is it um Beef from dairy is it sitting around 78 80 percent now? Did beef from yeah, yeah. So, Boomer said so, that in the last time so, around. So, so the beef industry is supplying about eighty percent of the of the beef market yeah. already, and 
I don't know if that will grow. I think I don't know if that's going to grow because it, we, yeah. we we still need. Uh, was it Boomer that said, Boomer Birch, who works for Cogent, mm -hmm. we interviewed him, um, and he said it's probably, at its, it might rise a percent or two, but he thinks but that's could, where it'll level now. Where it'll, where it'll level out. And it's just, it's just a matter of getting that, you, you, I know you mentioned Angus, but Angus is a really strong brand, like, globally, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, if you, yeah, yeah. you go in uh, an Angus burger, an Angus steak, doesn't matter where you go, it, it carries a premium, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Uh, and the Angus, uh, out of a Holstein cow, is... A very good product yeah, and a very right. uniform product. Very common as well, isn't it? Very, yeah. Very, very common. And, and, and from a processing point of view, like in your abattoir, you'll love them because they're pretty much all the same shape and yeah. the same weight and finish at the same. So, so you know, for, from that point of view, they tick a lot of the boxes. They do, they? and I think they tick a lot of the boxes for supermarkets. Mm. You know, they're wanting, yeah. the, the, as Volume, I say, they, they're quality. putting their steaks out at five pounds yeah. each, so they're wanting them. That's a big thing with the whole weight side of it. They're wanting them to just fit in a packet. Yeah. It's all the steak has to fit in that packet. Because they've fallen away from those per kilo days where the huge, yeah. it, each each pack was a yeah. different price. Now yeah. they just want a, a start, like a consistent price across. And from the a livestock production point of view, it it's a you know a, on, a, on a big dairy enterprise, having a, a beef enterprise on the side of it with Angus works phenomenally yeah. well. Uh, if they can do it right, it's definitely. If they can do it well, asset. if they've got the the land and and the and the, the buildings and set up to do it, it's a, it's a great it's a great business to run alongside your dairy. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I think there'll be a big demand in years to come, definitely, for, yeah, yeah. for boys in the dairy side that can do it right. Um, yeah, no, definitely. It's it's gone to the days where it's just a byproduct of milk. Yeah. There's much more of a focus no, on no, it. No, no, they're, I think it's exciting times for... Definitely. But the price of store cattle and stuff now, you know, it's it's crazy, and there's there's definitely a lot of money to be made at it. Um, the price of, like, e e right. all the way from baby calves to stores in here on a Wednesday is just wild, isn't it? It's very good. But nothing like... The states at the moment, USA. Have you looked at like calf prices in USA? No. Okay. So a Holstein calf, three, four week old Holstein calf in the US is about a thousand dollars at the moment. A thousand dollars, Christ. You know. So it just goes to show you, um, we are probably still behind that. Their consumption of beef over there per person is is massively yeah. higher to what we eat here. That's for sure. They are driven by steaks and burgers. Yeah. Exactly. The Americans are yeah. massive. But I just know I've seen um, the uh, Matt Engel from Lucky Holsteins mm. in Illinois. He just sent, me a, dollars. sent me a picture of his, uh, of his calf check from the local stockyard the other day. So it he was... sells it to like a stockyard? Is that like a... Yeah. Is that like a market or like yeah, a like, like, like we, Yeah, like a, like, like a market like us. So that's a bit of a no-brainer for them then to me. Christ. And you get the milk check on top of that. I'm just looking for. Where is it? Well, that, that could be. It could just keep driving, you know, even in this country, you know, because there's always going to be a demand for it. But it's mm -hmm. where, 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 where does it stop? It has to stop at some point Always because the, the consumer out. will stop mm. and buy more chicken. You sell all species in your shop. Do you sell chicken as well? Uh, yeah, I do sell a lot of chicken. So um, I everything really, anything to do. We sell fish as well. So do you? A bit of salmon and stuff. Or it was James's Smokehouse and Annan and. Stuff like that, yeah. It's just there, John. There, there it is. There. So just there's his calves. They're in pound weight. So like 87. 80, eighty-seven pound calf. What will be like forty? Yeah, like forty-one. 45, yeah, for, for, forty-five. Yeah. Pound. Um, that's the price per pound. It's like ten yeah. ten dollars a pound, which is, but like that's nine hundred and twenty-two dollars. That one's slightly, there, isn't there? slightly heavier. See, these are all Holstein calves. So just you know, that's that's phenomenal. And then he also he also used a little bit of wagyu in his herd. So, what do you think of the wagyu job? One final thought. Um, I would say probably it's there's a great market for it, but I would say it's. What do you mean? Think it, mainstream wise though. Uh, no, I don't. I don't, I don't think, I think it's hard work for the dairy boys. I think they're quite a soft animal, aren't they? Even from a consumer point of view, do you really think there's a market there for people to be buying it in their everyday shop? Uh, not in everyday, no, no, definitely not. I think it's a high end, like them down in London and places like that, and like maybe places like Dubai, mm. and stuff like that. You know, they, they they love it, and there always will be a good market for it. But I think it's, I think it's for the top end wagyu. Yeah. I think for the very very purebred wagyu. Yeah. Definitely. I don't know if it's really that good in the dairy industry. I think your, as you say before, your Angus and stuff are probably more of a. A smarter move. Yeah, for I would that. say. So, um, and I like it too. If you if you're looking if you're looking to run a beef enterprise alongside a dairy enterprise, mm -hmm. the, the the Angus calf finishes quite you know I don't know how many months earlier it'll finish before a wagyu, but it's 
it'll be months and months. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, so the, the, the space it takes up in a, in, a, in a building is a lot less, and and there's so such easy cattle to rear the Angus. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's the same with any native cattle at home on the farm. They can they, they can turn fat in a few weeks pretty quickly. You know, you can yeah. you need to keep a good eye on them. Whereas a continental can kind of animal or a beast can it can take a lot longer. So yeah, yeah, these harder continental types can be hard going, can't they? Yeah. yeah. Well, John, I've. I thoroughly enjoyed having you today. I've learnt a lot. I should have brought some of the meals down. <laughs> you should I should have. We're really going to have to get them on a 30 day challenge. Them, uh, yeah, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot for our listeners to really go and like, check out the <laughs> Farm to Fork. Farm to Fork, yeah. you check Check What's, what's the, uh, the sports event you're doing? Uh, High Rocks. High Rocks, check that out. Um, and you've got the, you, you, your the YouTube, YouTube channel, channel is all, always ready club. Always, so you'll put it all in the notes. I will put it all in our notes. Always, yep. always ready club. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, if you're in Lockerbie, check out the the, the butcher shop. It's it's worth it's worth visiting. Yeah. And uh, no, I've, this I've, time next month you will not recognise. I'm Clint. telling you, <laughs> you'll be half the man. <laughs> <laughs> Sign up for his first time. No, I've, I've, re I've really enjoyed uh, really enjoyed getting to know you. It's been it's been uh, inspiring and uh, educational all at the same time. So it's been great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having me. What do you think of that then, Glenn? I, I was, I was actually blown away. I didn't, obviously I know his dad. Yep, I know, I know because you're Irish and I know he's Irish. Sam, yeah, we're both from County Antrim. <laughs> but uh, I didn't really know much else about it all, eh? and I didn't know that he did the, the farm to fork. I find that just phenomenal. I didn't, I didn't know he was like a, a, a fitness. You didn't know he was Britain's fitness farmer? I didn't know he was that at all. Um, I, I, and I learned so much, because I don't really, um, the whole, uh, beef and lamb process inside of I, I don't really know much about it but I I really um, I really find that really really interesting huh? and yeah. Yeah, he seems completely motivated I think that business is going to go from strength to strength and he's growing it he's growing the business as as he learns and develops and yeah it's really good yeah uh, his determination and commitment is is phenomenal um, yeah, I, I, to be fair, I do. I love the synergy between nutrition and fitness, so farming and fitness. I just think this, this is such a crossover there. What a farmer produces and what it can, how it can fuel your body to perform, it's just phenomenal. And probably we don't, we don't tell that story no. enough in 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 around food. No, we we kind of miss a trick there. We definitely do. We definitely do. Um, John could do for beef and lamb what the body coach did for chicken when he did the 15 minute meals. No, he, honestly, but we could do so much more. Eh? And I was just, and, oh, yeah. he, and I also can see his uh, sports and training and all that helps him motive, helps him on his business side to, you know, it's... it's uh, Absolutely, yeah. strike that work-life balance. It's really good. Physically and mentally fit. So it's inspired you, has it? Well, I don't want to commit to something I'm not going to really, but I think I should do it, shouldn't I? I think you should give I it a I think I should get the farm to fork meal program and See what you can give achieve. it 12 months. 12 months, wow. Well, if you're gonna do it, I'm not gonna like, you're not gonna change and... No. I'm not gonna become like John in no, 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 a month. No. no, no, but John didn't become like himself in a month either. No, no, but if I was gonna do something, I wanna learn a little bit about it, what the commitment means and then do it. Yeah, see what you could do. Uh, do you think I could do it? I think you could do it. I think you'd be surprised at what you could achieve if you stuck to it even just for 30 days. Yeah. And then you can decide, yeah, that's not for me, or... Or I'm just like an Angus guy. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Eat and sleep. <laughs> Eat and sleep. <laughs> no, no, I'm really, I'm really, uh, really interested in it. Look, I, I, I'm going to definitely look into it, and if I commit to it, I'm going to go 100% do it. And then you'll have to give up your dates with Drew on a Friday. Wow. That's not poor Drew. Chili hot dogs. You from love Pioneer. Them. They're really special. Chili hot dogs. <laughs> extra chili, extra cheese. <laughs> um, anyway, um, another month passes. Uh, that was a phenomenal interview. Um, please like, subscribe, share with your friends. Um, do all the needful. We've tagged everything that we've discussed today, uh, linked everything in our description box. Do you know the other thing I was going to say before you like, finish completely? Mm. If anybody's got any... Um, ideas who we can have yes. on the 
please send in your suggestions. Because I got a couple, I was, I was at a farm yesterday and I, um, people were like saying, we really enjoy the podcast, who are you getting on next? And I said, well, I, I don't know, but any suggestions? So, if you guys, any of the listeners got any suggestions who we can have on, yep. send them in. Yeah, or if you want to get involved in it, please give us a shout. And um, we'll leave our details down below. Um, and yeah, get in contact and we can get you on the podcast. And you can be grilled by Glyn. Uh, grilled? Grilled. Nah, he doesn't grill, he's more of a saute. Steam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he has been the one and only Glyn Lucas. And you've been the one and only Laura Miller. And this was the one and only podcast. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>